Welcome everybody. I think we're live, ready to go. I'm John T. Brunyi. I'm an organic farmer, regenerative farmer, an environmentalist, a foodie, and the head of regenerative agriculture and sustainable food at FarmEd, the Centre for Food and Farm Education in the Cotswolds. And it's a real pleasure to be here. What a pleasure to be first up as well. I don't know how we follow that. It's absolutely overwhelming. 4,000 people, 150 sessions, the biggest conference, farming conference in the world, I think. It's amazing. So no pressure, guys, okay? Thank you for coming to this session. Something that's close to my heart is diversity and rotation. How do we build better rotations in our farming systems? How do we get diversity through everything that we do on our farms to improve our soil, our food, the food chain, our animals, our livestock health, and ultimately the health of the planet? And it's an absolute pleasure to be joined by friends and colleagues from around the world. I've got Nikki Cannon, or Nicola Cannon, Dr. Nicola Cannon, should I say, from the Royal Agricultural University in Sirencester, UK. Ian Wilkinson, founder, director of Cotswold Seeds Limited and Farm Ed. And we've got Jeff Tatch and Yichao Rui from the Rodale Institute in Pennsylvania, USA. And I'm gonna, I've got the easy bit today of chairing the session. I'm going to hand straight over to Nikki Cannon to introduce the concept of rotation, rotation, rotation. Nikki. Thank you very much, John T. So, um, first of all, um, can I have my screen up, please? No, you've got the wrong screen up. Thank you. Good. So um, this was the kind of common picture of villages, rural life in the UK, um, going back into medieval periods. And this was called the three field system, which was initially set up by the Romans and involved the kind of simplest form of a crop rotation. And if we look in here, we can see that um, the um, my slides aren't going through. My point is not. Uh, here we go. Sorry. Um, we can see that the first of all, there's the autumn planted crop area where things like wheat or rye were sown, spring planted area um, where maybe legumes or another cereal was sown, and then that important fallow area. And these were rotated round every year and also used in conjunction with the common pasture and the meadows and other land so that livestock could be taken out to graze on um, the common land during the day and brought back to the uncropped areas at night. And um, that all helped to bring fertility into the system. And of course, you can see lots of lines on there as well, which um, indicate the ridge and forest system, which was created by the teams of oxen who were uh, ploughing the soil up into ridges to improve fertility and to try and increase the amount of area they were farming and help with drainage. And these were often long strips which swung at the end as the teams of oxen pulled out. And that kind of carried on until the um, mid 18th century when people like Thomas, um, not Thomas, um, Jethro Tull came along and produced books such as Horse Hoeing Husbandry and he created the um, seed drill. Now some of what um, Jethro Tull wrote would kind of make a shiver slightly today because he spoke about pulverizing the soil to create the right environment to sow the seed in. But what he did catch on to was the point that if we place seeds more precisely, we could potentially increase yield and manage our crops better. And this concept was further developed by Turnip Townsend, Charles Townsend, who was a farmer from um, Raynham in Norfolk, but also a dignitary and um, a highly political creature, hence why he got the recognition for this. And he created what was known as the four course rotation, a Norfolk four course rotation. And this was fundamentally changed the three field system because there was no longer the need for a fallow in here as he put in um, break crops such as turnips and swedes and grass clover lays. And of course, clovers are leguminous crops. And from this, it meant there was um, things to sell 
um, at every stage of the crop rotation, um, hence improving productivity. And this enabled the Enclosures Act to happen because landlords could realise the potential of their land. And that enabled the Industrial Revolution because there was surplus food to sell into the cities, which meant that developments could happen. So if we put this on a timeline, we can see that the was so-called agricultural revolutions, part of the very first revolution from the Neolithic people where they moved from hunter-gatherers to having these areas of cropping where they took the biggest seeded plants so they had a staple source of food. Then through to the three-field system from when the Romans came in and that stayed much the same until the likes of Jethro Tull, Robert Bakewell, Thomas Cook and Turnip Townsend who produced the second agricultural revolution. And then of course the third agricultural revolution, which is often known as the Green Revolution, was brought about predominantly by um, Norman Borlaug, who created dwarfing genes in wheat, which meant they could respond to fertilizer much more. And this fundamentally changed the way we farmed because we could expect much higher yields because of synthetic fertilizer. And it um, prompted the development of, of herbicides and fungicides and such like. But obviously we're seeing some challenges with that today. And it's perhaps time that we're looking at the fourth generation um, of the agricultural revolutions, because the first generation or the second generation came about with the Enclosures Act. Um, this was linked to the making of ammonium nitrate fertilizer and this fourth agricultural revolution may be due to digital, it may be due to environmental destruction that we're causing, it may be due to genetic um, challenges such as GM, but hopefully it's due to a regenerative farming system which um, works for us to rethink and improve our agricultural systems. And we've seen this over time with experiments such as the um, the Rothamsted broad bulk experiment where they showed that by continuously growing wheat, you have suppressed yields in comparison to where rotations are put in place. And generally when rotations are put in place with other farming practices, we've seen increases in yield. And our challenge is how to make uh, maintain satisfactory yields um, in modern farming systems by using the best um, knowledge that we have of how to farm our soils without damaging our environment. And for many reasons, we want to use crop rotations because they can help maintain soil health and biology. They can prevent soil erosion. They can allow us to build up soil organic matter and help improve the structure of yields whilst helping us control weeds, pests and diseases through causing natural breaks in their cycles and delivering the opportunity to um, minimise risk by spreading your risk around, manage workflows, labour flows on the farm, um, add diversity in there for livestock and um, wildlife, allow nutrient budgeting and um, allow greater productivity through the increased use of land. So hopefully that just gives you a very brief introduction of why we've developed the kind of crop rotations we've got today. Brilliant. Thank you, Nikki. I think that historical context is crucial to know where we've come from and why, what's been driving it a little bit, which is crucial. And I think we probably all agree that what, where we have got is a specialised agricultural system now and rotation has nearly been forgotten about in its truest form, in its deepest form. And I think we're all seeking, hopefully all seeking, uh, ways of working differently now in the future. Um, and this is where I hand over to Ian at uh, Farmhead and Cotswold Seeds to really talk about the rotation there at the farm at, and what the work that Ian's been doing on diversity um, and doing th something different. Over to you, Ian. Thanks. Thank you very much, John T. Um, great to see everybody this morning. And I am going to pick up on uh, rotation, diversity, and opportunities within that. Um, so we're I'm, I'm uh, in the middle of Oxfordshire at the moment, a, a sort of an agricultural county, which is um, uh, 600,000 people strong. Uh, agriculture is really important to us. And um, 
I think it's just a great uh, story that I've got to tell you in, in the next 10 minutes. So um, starting at the very beginning, I've, I've been involved um, with agriculture for 35 years. Uh, I always wanted to be a farmer and for most of my farming time, um, I, uh, I, I've been a seed merchant. So for since I left Agricultural College, um, I've been a seed merchant. And I've had the great privilege to talk to uh, thousands of farmers, and it's been a wonderful experience. I've learned so many good things, and about 10 years ago, with those good things, we decided that we would uh, develop a demonstration farm showing the wonderful things we'd learned, mostly based around agroecology. So seven years ago, um, this is what uh, the farm looked like when we came to it. This is a view from the air looking straight down to the farm, uh, typical of Oxfordshire farming, typical of English arable farming, where most of the land, as you can see, is uh, is cropped with annual crops, so the yellow flowers or seed rape, uh, winter wheat, uh, barley, typical of the area. Lots of monoculture, not very much diversity. So we wondered, what could we do to change this monoculture system? And um, basically, we were we had inherited a, a, a continuous cropping system with cereals. This picture shows you uh, 60 acres of spring barley, which was um, interesting. We grew a perfect good crop for the first 12 months. We monitored everything that was going on on the farm for 12 months. And we were somewhat surprised at the end of it, even though we'd grown this beautiful monoculture, to see that this 60 acres of barley had actually, in fact, made us a loss, uh, only a small loss. But I spoke to many of my farming friends in the district and they said, well, welcome to the club. This is what's happening economically with monocultures. It's just not working anymore. So that was seven years ago. We then decided to create a plan, a plan based around rotations, about around diversity and providing opportunities for not just uh, biodiversity, but also for human beings. So this is our plan. I'm not going to go into the detail, this is not, but just to, so, to say that the top half of the farm is where we've developed uh, our eight-year rotation uh, around um, building soil. And this picture shows you what soil we're on. This is oolitic limestone. It's very stony ground. It doesn't hold moisture. It's inherently infertile. So this land has got a little bit of topsoil, and then we're into a lot of stone. So you can imagine, it's dry ground. It's very difficult to grow big crops unless you've got the fertility right. So we figured that we're in the middle of the UK. It's actually a pretty good temperate area for growing all sorts of different plant species. You know, we get plenty of rain, we have, if we can hold on to it in the soil, that is, and we can grow all sorts of different crops. We have a huge range of, of edible and fertility-building crops. Right at the heart of our rotation now is deep rooting fertility building lays. This is a herbal lay or picture of a herbal lay showing many different species growing together as a pasture, a pasture which forms four years of our eight year rotation. This pasture is really important. It's deep rooting. It's resilient because of its deep roots. So it doesn't stop growing. It grows most of the year. It's drought resistant, in other words. It's protein rich. The animals that graze this manure and fertilize the soil. And it's particularly impressive in terms of its output without any inputs, i.e. no fertilizers, no pesticides. It's nitrogen fixing, of course, because of a lot of legumes. It's very healthy forage too. We don't have many vet and med spills on this farm because the animals that eat the forage are incredibly healthy. Huge amounts of vitamins and minerals being drawn through the animals and ultimately into our food system. It's an, many of these plants are naturally anthelmintic, so we don't need synthesized anthelmintic products either. Great for pollinators, great for birds. And there's opportunities within amongst all this, not only to, to improve the soil, but of course to have businesses that spring off the back of it, such as uh, livestock, such as milk, uh, and of course subsequently arable crops. So we have um, a number of animals on the farm. We believe intrinsically it's important to have diversity both in terms of plant and animals. This is, this is how we graze. There's actually two groups you can see here. One group is sheep, mob graze sheep. The other group is humans talking about how we might develop fertility. And one thing I found really interesting on this farm, which is a demonstration farm, is that when you start to bring diversity together, huge numbers of people want to talk about it. And it's been such a fascinating experience. We do plow. And the reason we plow is quite simple. We have to get from grassland to arable cropping. And with the way we do that is by shallow plowing. Now, we have, this is a zero input farm. We don't use any pesticides, we use no fertilizers. But it does mean that we have to cultivate the land in order to get our seedbeds for the next crop. 
And in our case, the next crop after our four-year fertility building lay is a wheat. And this is the center of this field is a winter wheat. It's a highly diverse winter wheat, a mixture that was given us given to us by the Tortha Tia, uh, farmer and bakery in Wales. It was a, it was a, it's an ancient grain. This is pre-industrial, uh, pre-green uh, revolution, an ancient grain mix that we were given a small quantity of. And over the last five years, we've built the quantity of seed up and it's now sown on five acres of ground. We're working this year with the newly formed Heritage Grain Trust, which is a brilliant opportunity for us. And we are looking to increase the diversity and to make uh, opportunities for people uh, in the local district to mill this flour that the, these grains produce for human consumption. We've taken a little while to build it up. We've used some uh, small machinery to get there, but now we're on a reasonable scale and we're happy the way it's going. But what's particularly important is the genetic diversity within the old grains. Now, diversity is wonderful, when, especially when you, can, when you can mix different species together, as we're doing with our fertility building lays. But with it, monocultures like wheat, we can still get diversity in by growing different wheats together. We also, underneath the wheats, and, and our, this is actually our oat crop, underneath we grow legumes. And these legumes are bicrops, which are growing alongside and with the cereal. So the cereal isn't a monoculture, it's actually a bicrop. Really important so we can graze our sheep afterwards. This is a, actually a performing a number of jobs. It's a fertility building crop. It's in our rotation as a, as a, effectively as a green manure. It's also a bird seed crop and it gets grazed by sheep. So actually these are crops that are de generating many different outputs and provide many different opportunities on the farm. We can grow some huge crops without fertilizers. This is rye and vetch, which was grown as a winter green manure and they're left to bulk up. No fertilizers, no pesticides, huge amounts of organic matter going back into the soils. And finally, you might be wondering, what happened to that 60 acres of barley? Well, we kept a control plot of two and a half acres, and that control plot still remains now, today, just outside from where I am now. Everyone comes to see it. It's really interesting because it shows what happens to the soil when it's continually cropped with cereals. And it's a lovely working demonstration. We're still applying pesticides and we're still applying fertilizers to this plot. And right next to it, we have our eight-year rotation that we're comparing side by side. And what's brilliant is that people come to this farm and they look to see things. So yes, well, I can tell you that the organic matter levels have gone up from a scientific point of view. We've got lots of records showing that. But look at it. You can see it. You don't have to see the science behind it. You can see it, you can smell it, you can feel it. That to me counts and it counts for the people when you start to see it. So I'll have to stop there because I know my time's running out, but I would just finish with, we are hoping to still run Oxford Real Farming Conference in the field in June, fingers crossed. So I hope that you will be able to see, feel, smell and touch what I've just been showing you in the last 10 minutes. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Ian, thank you. That was a, a wonderful quick overview of what's happening at FarmEd and, and the rotation there. Um, we're going to take questions from the audience at the end of the session, but Nikki, I wondered if you had a question at this point for Ian. Yeah, thank you very much, Ian. Um, it's amazing what you've done there, and it's amazing to add diversity back into our landscape. But of course, adding diversity adds certain challenges, doesn't it? And how do you cr cope with having many more crops that you are growing on the farm and dealing with issues such as storage and logistics of those crops? Well, you, you, it's a great question, Nick. It's absolutely the right question because I, when I was young, I worked on a small mixed farm, which was doing a very similar to thing to what we're doing now. And you know, we had huge amounts of diversity on small farms. So we had to have some storage. We had to find ways to market. And that's exactly what's happening now. So we have got a number of different uh, enterprises on the farm. So we have um, the heritage grains. So that will be heritage grains, hopefully grown and developed by local farmers for the local millers, for the local bakers and consumed by local people. So these are opportunities. Yes, they're problems in a way because we have small quantities of lots of different items. We have a micro dairy starting this month. Now that's going to give us a small quantity of milk. But once we overlap it into our vegetable production, into our box scheme, into our collection points, we can begin to build a business that's truly diverse, which reflects the diverse cropping. But you're dead right. You know, this is a long-term build. You cannot just change the, you know, we, we have incumbents positions here. We, we have to develop over time to develop brand new ways of going to market. And then when we've done those, all of us together, other people will join and they'll step off the conventional into the new normal. And it's just, I mean, I'm just, 
so pleased at how many people are engaging in these conversations outside of pro what you'd call primary farming. It's the people down the chat. I'm sure Rodel are going to talk about this. I'll have to stop. But to me, there's just, you know, it, it's just alive with opportunities. You know, open the farm gate and people come in. This is exactly what's happened to us here. I give you so many examples. It, it, it's, you know, the world is, is, is ripe for change. Let's, let's make it. Thank you. Great. Yeah, thanks, Nikki. Thanks, Ian. Uh, there's definitely something about mindset in there, isn't there? You know, if we're going to get diversity, we, we've got the equipment, we've got the tools, we can build routes to market. But there's a big thing around diverse mindsets, which we'll come on to maybe another time. Um, I'd love now to hand over to Jeff over in Pennsylvania, a place close to my heart. I, I'm a Nuffield scholar and I spent a day or two at the Rodell Institute a few years ago and it blew me away and it inspired me on my journey down the regenerative route. So I'd love to hand over to Jeff now to explain what you're up to and what you're doing. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, Shanti, and uh, hello to everyone. It's a real honor to be here on behalf of the Rodale Institute. My name is Jeff Katch, and I serve as the Chief Impact Officer here at the Rodale Institute, one of the leaders of the organization. And I am joined by Dr. Yi Chao Rui, who is the Director of Rodale Institute's Farming Systems Trial. Can you kindly cue the slides, please? Thank you. So I'm here today to talk about uh, Rodale Institute's hallmark study. Uh, it's called the Farming Systems Trial. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with the work of Rodale Institute, we are widely known as the pioneer of the organic food and farming movement in the world. Uh, our founder, J.I. Rodale, is widely credited for coining the term organic as it's used today, and his son, Robert Rodale, began using the word regenerative as it relates to agriculture in the 1970s. Um, our founder knew that soil health was the essential piece of the equation. If we were really going to change the course of human history, human health needed to start in the soil. Um, he authored these words, uh, healthy soil equals healthy food equals healthy people back in May of 1942. And that really was the seminal moment for our work. Fast forward to the uh, late 1970s and J.I. Rodale's son, Robert Rodale, was going back and forth uh, to Washington, D.C trying to advocate for a national organic standard. He saw what was happening in agriculture and he wanted to safeguard that word. He believed that it needed to, to be defined with some real policy and legislation. But our uh, government basically laughed him out of the room and said, you know, Robert, if you want us to build policy and legislation around organic agricult agriculture, you, knew, you need to prove that it's not just a philosophy, but that it, there's science. And so he marched back to Pennsylvania and started uh, the, what is now known as the Farming Systems Trial in 1981. It is the longest running side-by-side -side comparative study of organic and conventional grain crops in North America. And after just nine years, after nine years, that was all it took uh, for us to begin proving out the data that organic systems were outperforming conventional systems. Uh, and it was enough for the uh, for our federal government to pass the National Organic Production Act. So now every time you go to the grocery store and you see that little organic logo on products, it was because of this hallmark study that gave our, our government and leaders in the food industry the confidence to, to build this legislation. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Rui to begin to unpack what we found in that study uh, and what we continue to find today. So thank you. Well, thanks, Jeff. Hello, everyone. My name is Yi Chao Rui. I am a soil scientist, also the research director of the Farming Systems Trial at Rodale Institute. So Jeff just gave a brief introduction of the trial. So what I'm going to do is to dig a little deeper and walk you through the different rotation systems, in, including recent modifications of this trial and how these different rotation systems impact on soil health. So as Jeff introduced, the farming system trial has three systems that represent the typical grain production system in the United States. A conventional system, an organic legume system, and an organic manure system. So these three systems differ from each other in cash crop and amendment. The uh, conventional system follows a simple corn and soybean rotation doesn't use cover crops and rely on synthetic chemical inputs for soil fertility and weed control. This is what the majority of the US grain farmers do. 
So if you drive on a road trip in the middle west, Midwest of the United States, basically you will see endless corn and soybean. So that's what the conventional system represent, represents. The organic legume system features a mid-length four-year rotation of corn, oats, wheat, and soybean. It doesn't have any chemical input for soil fertility and relies on nitrogen fixed fixed by leguminous cover crops, such as uh, hairy vetch and clover, so for fertility. Then we have an eight-year rotation of organic manure system in which we have three years mixed hay in addition to the cash grains. The soil fertility comes from both leguminous cover crops and the amendment, which is uh, the composted manure applied every four years. So different from the conventional system, which uses pesticides and herbicides, the two organic systems use crop rotations and cover crops to provide weed control. So 40 years of results show that when it comes to long-term productivity and profitability, the long-term average yield of the organic systems, especially the organic manure system, can match that from the conventional system. While the revenues and the profits are much higher in the conventional systems. And that's really attributed to the restoration of soil organic matter and soil health. Over the course of 40 years, the soil organic matter level increased in organic systems, but did not change much in a conventional system. And because of soil organic matter is central to soil health, other soil properties such as the aggregate stability, the water holding capacity also increased significantly in organic systems. As a result, in extreme dry years, you know, in a scenario of climate change, we see the yield of organic system can be up to 30% higher than that of the conventional system. So how does the soil organic matter chain happen? We thought that's because of the soil microbes or functioning differently in these systems. The more diverse crop rotation in the organic systems could provide a more diverse and a high quality diet to the soil microbes. So when I say high quality, I really mean that more inputs with lower carbon to nitrogen ratio and exudated by the plant roots. So these diverse and high quality inputs could stimulate the microbial diversity and abundance, which now we know are key to soil carbon sequestration. So with that fundamental change, soil microbes in organic systems can, re can really promote soil carbon storage by processing carbon inputs more efficiently and forming organic organo-mineral associations more efficiently. And apart from the fundamental differences, uh, it's also worth mentioning that the management systems had changed in the history of the farming system trial to stay dynamic and relevant to the recent, de recent development of agriculture in the world. For example, in recent years, both conventional and organic farmers are trying to reduce tillage because of the detrimental effect of tillage to soil health. So in 2008, all three systems were divided into till and a no-till. So in a conventional system, the, uh, the no-till is achieved by using chemical pesticides and herbicides, the Roundup glyphosate. While in organic systems, no-till is achieved by using tools such as the roller crimper. Also, in, uh, since 2014, a cover crop component has been added to some of the conventional plots as a conservation conventional, which is also, which is also getting popular among the conventional farmers. So in organic systems, what we do uh, to achieve no-till is that we plant winter uh, annual cover crops in the fall. And then in the next spring, we terminate the cover crops mechanically and plant cash crops into the residues of the co cover crops. And then in the growing season, the cover crop residues will become a weed suppressing mulch. 
that uh, with that, we don't need to use any chemical uh, pesticide or herbicide to control the weeds. So the question can be answered by this management shift is that, are these chemical-based no-till system regenerative? Is no-till or cover cropping itself enough to improve soil health? So here are some data from 2019. We can see that the soil carbon stock uh, from the zero to, to 20 centimeter depths. So you can see that despite the difference in soil carbon between the conventional and organic systems, reducing tillage had uh, completely uh, different effects in conventional and organic systems. In a conventional system, you can see that the no-till did not increase soil carbon. Actually, it caused severe soil compaction but no-till really increased soil carbon in organic manure system. Also, you can see that the conventional, uh, the, the so-called the conservation conventional, which means that adding a cover crop did not increase uh, soil carbon as well. So that really means that the no-till or cover crop, cover crop alone did not increase soil carbon in chemical-based simplified conventional systems. So a holistic approach, which means diverse crop rotation, reducing tillage and cover cropping are essential to regenerative agriculture and its agronomic and environmental benefits. So as a result, regenerative agriculture is not just a single practice. It's not a destination. It's a, a, a direction that we need to, you know, find our place on this the spectrum of agricultural practice. So we believe that wherever you are, where you are at on this spectrum, we need to move, gradually move our agriculture systems towards uh, more regenerative. And some future directions. So we uh, recognize the importance of reducing tillage continuously to refine organic no-till systems. So here are some examples of how we can do that to refine organic no-till systems. For example, we need to develop and refine technologies to offer more chemical-free weed control, which, which is, can be the number one challenge for organic farmers. Examples include the high-residue high cultivator, which you, you, you can use to cultivate the weeds when necessary, just underneath that cover crop residue mulch. Also, there are options such as the flame weeder and the weed zapper. These basically all embrace the mind of chemical free to offer more options for farmers to control the weeds. And also, we realized that the, the cover crop roller crimper system, no till system can control the between row weeds, but sometimes there are weeds come in a row which cannot be controlled by the cover crop residues. So we need additional tools such as the weed puller, which can you know, pull the weeds out from the inner row. So these are the uh, uh, project, ongoing projects that Rodel Institute, Institute is working on. And we believe that's the direction we need to move toward in the future to re refine our uh, organic system and move towards more regenerative. So thank you for your attention. With that, Nikki, I would like to turn that over to you, back to you. Thank you very much. Um, really interesting and inspiring to see how um, the move to organic systems, the inclusion of cover crops and diversity in those systems can add to soil carbon and the kind of benefits you were showing. You mentioned it didn't seem to be a problem in your presentation that you've effectively dropped the use of glyphosate and other herbicides for your organic system. But you then speak about the um, flame weeder. Do you really think that's a sustainable weeding option? Well, uh, this is a very interesting question because with the flame weeder, you still need to use fossil fuels right, to produce the energy. So that's my, that might not be so sustainable or regenerative. Uh, uh, I think the, the way to look at that is to, we're now at a time that we try to develop, develop different options that farmers can consider 
and adopt when they feel necessary or convenient. So we don't think there's any one single practice or you know a technology can solve all the problems, but we would like to develop develop all options that can be available when farmers uh, find them uh, uh, readily available at hand. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I think that's the whole thing. We have to go out and look for um, a multitude of solutions because as the green revolution showed us that one single solution can create its own set of problems afterwards. Um, I'd like to put a question out to both Ian and to the Rodale Institute that um, how do you think it's possible to reward farmers for these new diverse um, probably slightly lower yielding not always lower yielding um, production practices um, that are based on um, fairly complex agricultural systems yeah, I'm happy to attempt to take that one, but open it up to the group, certainly. Uh, here at Rodale Institute, you know, we believe that we need to begin to re-incentivize farmers for the right behaviors and practices on their farms. Uh, we've recently launched the newest high bar standard in agricultural production. It's called the Regenerative Organic Certification, and you can read more at regenorganic.org. Uh, this is the newest high bar standard that um, that asks farmers to at minimum make the organic certification, uh, but then we're pushing the bar and asking farmers to uh, be incentivized for accountability around soil health, animal welfare, and human labor. And the market is demanding brands to produce products to a higher degree of accountability. There's a premium, the, the highest level premium for these products comes when farmers are farming to that standard. Um, as the economic evidence from the farming systems trial has pointed out, the profitability is considerably more there for organic production systems. And now regenerative organic is only going to pr push that profitability even higher. That's amazing. Um, you know, and to think that we're moving on beyond organic to truly regenerative, which I think, you know, the very fact that we've gone from veganuary to regenerary is or however you say it um you know a really positive thing and that but we need guidance to make sure that people are using this phrase properly rather than just pinning it onto food when it doesn't truly meet those criteria ian do, do you have an answer yeah it's a good question I, I like jeff's approach um but i just add to that perhaps i mean we we are lacking leadership from government uh I know there's good intent, but at the moment it isn't follow, following through as far as I can see. But I, so I think for me, what it comes down to is developing trade between us. Um, I think it's about creating markets. Uh, I think we need to inspire and connect people uh, absolutely together. And, you know, the way we do that is through, um, you know, getting people, physically getting people together through knowledge exchange. And I think by doing that, we can create markets uh, for example, um, we have a CSA on the farm here, which brings in about 100 families to the farm. Uh, that's new, two years old. We have uh, co good connections with farmers uh, collaborating together, uh, good connections with the local mill uh, and potential new millers, as well as new bakeries. Um, you know, we, we hope to start a bakery here on this farm very soon. Um, you know, I, you know, we don't want everything to be on this farm. Don't, don't get me wrong. We just want to, you know, we want to create opportunities and connections between people in our district. That's where we yeah. can start. That's where we can all go and do something now. And once yeah. we do that, a little bit like the internet, you know, we can have many, many nodes on this uh, new future. Yeah. So if I may just add, add on to that, uh, Ian, uh, l allow me to give a real life example of something that's unfolding right now here in the United States. It's a beautiful example of a public-private partnership. Uh, here in Pennsylvania, there is one of the largest organic poultry producers in the world. It's a company called Bell and & Evans. And uh, the founder and CEO has made a mandate to his company that he will not purchase uh, organic imported grain. He wants to only source domestic grain. And as such, he's thrown down a challenge to the company Cargill to say, if you can source for me, regenerative organic grain here in the United States, I will guarantee you a, a long-term 10-year contract. And as such, he has contracted uh, Bell and & Evans 
has contracted Cargill and Cargill has hired Rodale Institute's newly established consultancy where our team of experts at Rodale will be going out to work with every single farmer in the Cargill network that desires to transition land to these regenerative and organic practices that Yi Chow so eloquently laid out. And so these farmers will be guaranteed a short-term premium on the transitional grain and a long-term even more premium on the organic grain. I believe they're promising five-year contracts. And so one by one, Rodell Institute is working with uh, public companies to, in an attempt to uh, redefine the supply chain and create markets. And so it's happening and, and we're beginning to see success there. Brilliant. Thank you, people. Um, I'm gonna jump in now in the final third of our session is the hard bit. We've got a wonderful set of questions coming in from the audience. Um, we've got about 15 minutes left. And just to say to the audience, we do have a Zoom chat room at the end of this. So if we don't get through all the questions, jump onto the Zoom room with us and we can continue the debate um, for another half an hour. Um, so just to throw some questions at everybody, if I may, that have come in. And then, sorry, I can't see people's names on um, the private chat that we're looking at or where you're from. So I'll just read out the questions. Um, this one's for Ian. Um, the road, the, the farm ed uh, rotation you spoke of is mainly an arable based rotation. Would you have any tips for anyone on a wet Welsh permanent pasture sort of grassland um, landscape? What, what? Think of a diverse rotation that could work there. Well, uh, perhaps you know, the risk of just a knee jerk comment. I mean, leave it alone. I, you know, I. I, I would be a little cautious about suggesting everybody has a rotation everywhere. Uh, you know, you have to think of your individual farms. Uh, there's a lot of places that would be much better permanent uh, cropping or no cropping. Um, you know, I, I think there's a, you know, the temptation is to say, well, everybody must, you know, follow a blueprint. And I think that's where we've gone wrong. You know, a lot of areas, you know, have, um, you know, have grown inappropriate crops and uh, you only got to look at soil quality to see that. So, uh, you know, I think I, I, I'm not perhaps giving a precise answer, but I would say have a, a semi-permanent or permanent uh, land use rather than uh, annual cropping on, on a wet, fundamentally wet, wet piece of ground. I hope that answers the question. Or well, maybe Herbridge lays in there somewhere if it's, you know, improved pasture or if, if it, it might be an arable lay we're talking about. I'm not sure well, in this instance. But. I mean, maybe, maybe, the, maybe the answer is that if you have, yeah, if you have um, a, you know, a, 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 a uh, monoculture grassland then perhaps you know some simple changes to that which were the introduction of new species of course you know legumes and and others i mean people do do that and i think that's a good thing to do to get away from simplified grassland systems because grassland systems aren't you know pasture systems should be diverse uh, clearly for them to function unless you want to plaster it with fertilizer and produce uh, you know this sort of watery yield that, that, that's fine diversity but, but, within the grassland yeah perfect um, and another one for you Ian I'm sorry um could you very quickly what is can you just spell out the eight years of the rotation years one to four are okay uh so that's our pasture which is a herbal lay which is a, a 17 species mixture grasses legumes herbs uh for all the reasons I mentioned before and uh, that to me, the four years, so the, I saw another question, and if I could just address two at the same time, the other question was, you know, is that is eight years the optimum? Well, I can tell you for sure, that I think four years is the optimum for grassland or thereabouts. You know, it could be three, it could be five, but it isn't one. You know, if you cover crops for one year, fine. You know, they do some good. But if you really want to improve soils and get structure right, you have to have something in the ground for a long time to, to create that. So four years, roughly speaking, in an arable rotation is where you need to be. That will control black grass. That will get you the structure. That will get you the organic matter. Uh, that means less machinery intervention. Um, it also means less arable crops. But maybe we should be growing less arable crops anyway. And those the arable crops that we do grow should be primarily for human consumption. So I'm 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 particularly thinking of livestock production when I say that because for me ruminant production should evolve around pasture and less around grains. I think we all know that fundamentally, and that would deliver that deliver that to us. So a lay farming system, the sort of thing Henry Edmonds has outlined, the sort of thing that many people, Graham Harvey, uh, you know, and, and many, many people before us, um, you know, George Henderson, for example, and others have said, you know, for so long, it's around the lays. It's the lay in this country at any rate. Like, again, it's not a blueprint for the whole world, but certainly here we need to build fertility. We have lost so much and it comes back to that for years. And then finally, in the second half of our rotation, sorry to answer your question, um, we have two, two uh, cereal crops. 
we could maybe take more, we choose not to. So we have two cereal crops and then many catch crops and, and uh, cover crops which build more fertility. You've got to remember, we're in the early stages of our, 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 convert, our transition to a more fertile uh, agroecological system. So we need as much diversity as we can. We don't just want uh, cereal crops. We want a lot of different things going on at the same time that offers opportunities for you know, re inc encouraging more biodiversity, encouraging more long-term thinking in, around soil fertility. Yeah. Um, and could you tackle, thank you for merging two questions together, could you tackle the question about why do you plough still? What, what are the issues there and why well, do we feel that we can still plough? Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, you know, I, I understand and, and that everyone, what, you know, that connected here today knows that both the you know use of overuse of um, herbicides and the overuse of uh, cultivations is, is a serious problem. We here chose to develop a system around um, uh, some cultivations, particularly at the end of the uh, lay period. We need to destroy the lay. We can't just direct drill cereals into that. Uh, I wish we could, but we can't. We've tried. We cannot get the cereal to compete. Uh, with the with the lay, so we've had to plow. We we developed. We took Rodale's plan, which I must say is excellent, uh, that off, on off online, and uh, d we built a crimper roller, which we have used here, and we can control uh, individual crops, rye, for example, but we can't. You know, when it's fully grown, but we can't control multi-species swords. So um, we we choose to plow, but it's a very shallow plow. It's not a sort of ten-inch digging plow that we have used principally in this country for years and years. This is a three inch pl shallow plow. Uh, there are two or three of them around Europe, which are quite common now. And they do work quite well, but we're still cultivating. So I wish we didn't have to, and I'm gonna take some of uh, Yi Chao's comments on board because I think we we have a long way to go. So we will develop our system, I'm sure, to have less cultivation. But at the moment, we're you know we a relatively small farm. We don't have a big, heavy direct drill that will punch through some of this material that we can grow. So we do have to cultivate. So that's one of our barriers. Yeah. Um, there's a question around the yield from the, the barley control plot. How does that okay. compare well, to the other yield? In a good year, it's quite it's more than um, probably double uh, what we would get with um, with a low input crop. But you've got to remember we're on a journey here, and also you've got to remember last year, for example, uh, the weather in the UK was particularly difficult. Very wet winter followed by a very very hot spring, and uh, we had a failure uh, on our continuous cereal. And that's not the first time in the seven years we've been going. We've had two complete failures on our monoculture cereal. Take that take the average of our seven years. Actually, it's not that great. It's quite low. It's just, you know, it's you have to look at the whole picture over time. So yes, our crops may not give us quite the same yield as a as a um, modern hybrid, a, a modern dwarf wheat would do, with all of the fertilizers and pesticides that it needs. So it will be a low yielding system. But I have seen that what we have with our agroecologically based rotation, it, it's a much more resilient, much more reliable average. So yes, it's lower yielding. That's what happens when you take the nitrogen fertilizer away, and certainly in the initial stages of transition. Let's not kid ourselves, that's what happens. We have to build fertility and find clever techniques to maintain the fertility and to increase the yield gradually over time, and then use the produce in a cleverer way. It's not it become inefficient with the way we use these monoculture crops. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll jump to a couple of questions for Jeff and Yu Chao, if I may. Um, Jeff, a couple of people have asked, where can they find out more about Rodale and the publications and the data? Yeah, very easy. So just rodaleinstitute.org. And when you arrive to the site, you'll just hover over the science tab. And under that, uh, you'll find the farming systems trial link. And you'll find it to be a very, very comprehensive resource of uh, Virtually everything Yi Chao talked through today, we have gone into greater depths on our website. So it's all there. Well, thank you. Um, question for Yi Chao. Um, given that yields are similar at Rodale, where does the extra revenue in the system come from? And the questioner asks, understands, that, um, understands why the profit is greater, but not the revenue side. And you're on mute, that's it. <laughs> sure. Thanks, John T. I think uh, we all know that with the organic produce, there's a price premium. So that's uh, where the the profit is coming from. Um, 
Uh, I think also because of we use uh, we have less cost of uh, chemical fertilizers and herbicide, which are you know the price is increasing um, at a remarkable speed. So the I think the profit will be um, uh, will be increasingly you know profit difference will be significantly different different between the organic and the conventional systems. Yep, uh, the organic market here in the United States is driving about a 20 to 30% premium at the moment. Uh, and that, that of course varies year to year and Rodale Institute always uses, uh, you know, sort of regional farm data so that we're comparing apples to apples uh, in our research to what farms are experiencing in the market in this year. Yeah, brilliant. thank you. Um, Ian and, and maybe everyone actually, um, there's something here about people and there's a good question about the diversity of enterprises such as the micro dairy at um, FarmEd. Um, Ian, can you explain a little bit about how the people side works, the number of people that work at FarmEd and how that fits with the cropping and stocking? Yeah, I, I always felt that, um, you know, through all my time that we we had seen this greater efficiency around mechanization and, and the clever use of some technologies. Uh, but it, it also meant that there was less people farming and it, it always bothered me and many other people I know. So I was very keen here to develop, um, you know, the human side of farming. I, I think f for me, farming is much more than just an economic business. I know it has to make money. You have to, you have to have money and trade in the system. I completely get that. But there was there was more, less people being, um, you know, it, engaged within what is such an important, in, uh, you know, uh, fundamental to our all of our lives that it it, it worried me, and I and I really wanted to and you know make sure that we had. Uh, opportunities that coming from these uh, th these systems that that, that that would provide people with um, with uh, you know either livelihoods or interests uh, you know well-being whatever it might be. So um, in the case of the micro dairy, uh, we have a young man like me, not from a farming background, but wanted to go into farming. Who's in his late twenties? Who is now Hallam is about to start his micro dairy here, and this is a very small dairy. It's a small business for him, but he, it it is a, a an obvious thing to add on to our. Uh, existing um, small farm and so it's um, he's made a small investment which he hopes he will recoup he's connecting into the people that are already here on the farm uh, there are so that's uh, one young person there are three people already employed in the CSA that that's a separate business to this farm uh, but is is on the farm and that brings people to us uh, so to speak uh, a, 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 as a as a farming you know operation um, there are a hundred families connected to the farm there are also other people who work part time here on the farm. We have a sheep enterprise on the farm, which initially was a flying flock, which enabled another young person to get to, to increase the size of, of of their flock and to move around this district, introducing animals into areas that were not already there. And of course, the animals, you know, are really important in this farming system because it brings the fertility. And but you have to have you know people who are prepared to look after animals because not everybody wants to. So, um, so I think, sorry, in answer to your question about the number of people, roughly, um, I think, including the farm ed team, there's something like 12 people now employed on the farm. Um, and, you know, that's from nothing. Um, and, you know, we also have, the other thing I must stress is that, you know, we connect very much with the food here. So the farming is one side, but the food is the other. And for me, it's about that. That's the important thing. It's that's what we're growing. That's what we're producing. Um, and it's not just it, it, the economics are important, but I, I feel agriculture has become somewhat disconnected from the people that eat the food that it, it provides. And so we're in our small way trying to reconnect people. It's been a very interesting uh, opportunity because there are, you know, it's a whole a whole new um, area of trade that we can do. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you very much, everybody. We are getting to the end of our time. There's probably about 30 seconds left. So I just want to say thank you. Something that's really hit me is something that Yi Chao said, which is you know, if we're going to make this big difference, particularly with soil organic matter and healthy soils, we've got to have cover crops, no-till and diversity. I think some of us are brilliant at two of those or three of or one of those, but we need to get it all working together to see those big results. And that's a massive challenge. Um, but hopefully we'll learn a lot more about that over the next few days at the Oxford Wheel Farming Conference. Um, thank you. Keep the questions coming in, everybody, if you can. So we're going to jump on the Zoom in a minute. Hopefully the, um, the link has been posted for everybody. Um, if you're interested in a little bit more of what the Farm Ed team have to say, 
We've got another session on Tuesday next week talking about from soil health to gut health. Well, we're trying to make that link now. That's so what? So we've got great soil. What does, does that make a difference for our livestock and ultimately human health? Um, so we'll be working with Dr. Sally Bell on that uh, session next week. So keep in touch. Come and say hello if you can, if you're anywhere near FarmEd. Um, and if you're anywhere, you know, it's a global conference, which is wonderful. Um, and hopefully we can you know, keep in touch somehow. This is a wonderful first um, first day of Oxford. What a great thing. Thank you very much, everybody. See you in the Zoom room. Um, enjoy. <laughs>